Hey gang, hey everybody. Welcome, 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 welcome. It's uh, Saturday, Saturday morning here in Los Angeles where I am, 11 a.m. And not sure where all of you are. Please give me a shout out in the comments here. I, I wanna see where everyone's from. These have been such a joy to do. Um, I'm already seeing a bunch of comments. It's so nice to see all of you um, talking to each other. <laughs> it's, um, <laughs> I, I'm sure like, uh, like all of you, I've, I've been talking with, with friends and yesterday I spent a couple hours speaking to my mentor, my dear friend, uh, David Weiler, who's the choir director who got me singing and got me composing. And we were just commenting about how much we ache for, for human contact again, just being connected to each other. It's really starting to take a toll, I find, after six months. And so even just seeing all of you in the comments saying hello to each other and talking, it's, um, it's really beautiful. It's, it's, it warms my heart. It makes me feel like, like we're all here together in one way or another. Uh, okay, gang. Um, <laughs> I thought and thought and thought how we, by the way, before I do this, can, can you just all confirm that you can hear that here? <laughs> we just say in the comments, if you're hearing the actual piano sound, um, I, I thought and thought and thought how do we approach this piece? Um, and I, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I still don't have an answer. We'll, we'll go through it um, bit by bit. There's, with the other pieces, we kind of did a sing through, you know, where we rehearsed uh, different, different sections. And then in a way we even sang through it at the end. But I'll tell you with, with You Rise, I Fall, first, first of all, it's, um, I think next to When David Heard, it's probably the most virtuosic choral work I've ever written. And by virtuosic, I mean just difficult to sing. It's truly difficult. And it's not at all designed to be sung on your own. Um, any of you who have performed my music know that I have this dream of singers anyway where they don't breathe, that they just have gills. <laughs> and, and what happens, of course, is I write these long, long, impossibly long lines that um, they can only be performed if you're stagger breathing. You know, if you sneak a breath here or there, but your colleague next to you doesn't sneak a breath. And You Rise, I Fall is the ultimate example of this. There are phrases, like musical phrases that last 45 seconds, sometimes a minute, where they just, they go up, 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 and then all the way down, and there's no real chance to take a breath. And the, the times that I've rehearsed this with the Los Angeles Master Crow, with my own group in London, with the excellent uh, Bob Cole Chamber Choir in, uh, from, from Long Beach, Cal State Long Beach, you know, everybody always has the question, which is like, where would you like us to breathe? <laughs> and the answer always is, I'd prefer if you didn't. Um, uh, for those who, who are interested in that, for if you've got any composers in the room, the reason for that, I have a, a very specific reason, is that um, Schoenberg, famously wrote that a phrase is any group of notes that can be sung in one breath. I really believe that. And I think that the human mind and the human body, even when just listening, can feel how long a phrase is. They just know. They, they know. They hear the, the sound of it, then a breath, then we move on to the next. It's, it's just hardwired in. And I think composers over the centuries have played with that idea that what you can do is if you can, if you can make a phrase that's longer than, than a human being can breathe, and you hear this all the time, say, in Mahler with big, long string melodies that are 30, 45 seconds long. The mind knows that. And the mind, I think, uh, is enraptured in a way. There's a, it creates a, a kind of otherworldly place where, where this, this, the rhythm of breathing is changed. And, and the, our own rhythm as we listen to it is altered. I think we probably breathe slower or quicker as we listen to it. And the reason I bring all of this up is because in the construction of this piece, You Rise, I Fall, there's these two ideas at play. This one where, where there's this swell of grief and pain and anguish that is relentless, that can't possibly have a breath. And then at the same time, the, the musical counterpoint against that is, is Julie's final breaths, which are, Dion, Dion, just barely being able to breathe. You really, just the, the smallest amount of air that, that can be brought into the lungs. And 
I think as I was trying to build this, I, I don't remember now, but I'm, I know myself and I know this is how I would approach it. I, I was trying to, trying to balance these two ideas. This is a long, long way of saying that, that for us to sing through this, to actually sing through it is not, I, I just don't know if, it, if we can do it. If, if I couldn't do it, I couldn't sit in a room alone and sing through this, be, setting aside the emotional content of the piece, just the physical content. I think, but anyway, it, what we'll do is we'll go through a little bit of it um, and, and kind of talk through it. And then I'd like to play through it. And if, if you're all game for this, we'll play through it. We're going to go back and listen to the movement, the entire movement before it, because that has everything to do with what this movement is in the Sacred Veil. Vale. Let's start from the very beginning. So um, the, the very first notes that we hear, right? This is everybody here and we... This thing. Now, where this motive comes from in the piece is it's... Um, it, it actually gets played with. There's there's this these notes that that well, if if we go all the way back, for me this is I'm not a religious person, but this is the holiest part of the work. And for those of you who have been following along, you know that the middle C throughout the sacred veil represents the veil itself, and that there's notes that are above the veil, and notes that are below the veil. And so here there's this, and we hear this e even in the fourth movement. You hear it in the piano, this, this kind of thing. Where this comes from, by the way, is by a piece by the Swiss composer Frank Martin. It's his mass. And the Sanctus begins. If you don't know this work, the Mass by Frank Martin, it's spelled Martin, M-A-R-T-I-N. Run, don't walk, run to, to Spotify, to Apple streaming, wherever you need to, and listen to this piece. I can't tell you from start to finish, it's, it's in my very humble opinion, one of the top five choral pieces ever written. And so that quote is very intentional, those notes. And what we hear then is, it slides and gets a little corrupted with that added second in there. But where we first introduce this actual motive is um, is several movements before um, when uh, which movement is it's the seventh the eighth movement which is called Delicious Times and the um, Julie is talking she's writing about how her her children um, you know that that they she was shaving her hair off and her children would laugh. And the notes there, and they would laugh. It, sorry, I, I know I'm going to have to go deep, deep into the weeds just to explain this, this one piece that you rise, I fall. But the idea there then was that, that in that moment, in, in this moment where she's, she's being playful and strong and somehow trying to include her children in this, this impossible journey that she's on, that that she talks about them laughing and it's there's joy but it's tinged with not only sorrow but i would say inevitability i imagine there's some part of uh, of in julie's writing that that she knew she at least at the very least she knew that it was a possibility and so that's what's built into this and that's why when we hear her first breaths here at the very beginning of this piece we hear and then they fall away and then that expands right and then okay so what we're hearing here in terms of the musical construction is you get remember at the very beginning of the piece when the cello plays and then we get then here then and then finally so those are those notes right one there's the e flat there's the f and it's always aspirational and mirroring that that fated wheel that the cello plays at the very beginning of the piece and which kind of haunts us all the way through so that's the reason all of those notes are there and then we finally come down to if, oh, by the way for any of you who have the sheet music 
um, uh, or don't have the sheet music. The, I think there's a link right here in in on YouTube, and you can you can download it. I, I think it's just a couple of bucks. You, you can buy it and follow along. But it's in five, six, seven. Then in measure seven, when we get um, this. Now that's Julie's theme, right? This note, these three notes, and it permeates the piece. You hear it all over. And in fact, you'll you'll hear it in the movement right before we'll talk about this, where she says, "Don't give up on." So even in that moment, and then the piano. So, so here on that first bit, and then this bit where Tony wrote uh, what has to be some of the most beautiful poetry I know, um, uh, the listening to your labored breath, your struggle ends as mine begins, that, that what's happening here is this melody... simple and plaintive, but that's a direct quote from the very first movement when the choir is singing silent, either in or out of this, our fragile fleeting world. And for me, this was this, these two ideas were married to each other, that even at the beginning of the story, we know that there's, there's a limited amount of time. There's a finite amount of time and it's so fragile and it, it, it's this side of the veil. And it's this side of the veil. So what I did with Tony when we were constructing this is I sent him that melody. And I said, Tony, I need, I need words that fit this exact metrical structure. Not even poetry, really. It needs to be lyrics. And this is what Tony sent back to me, which is just astonishing. By the way, the, the, the way this, this all came about was I wrote the words, You Rise, I Fall. I, I had this idea for the title of it. Of, of that being the title of the piece. I didn't know if I would set those words, but knowing Tony and watching him go through this, I, I loved the contrast between uh, you rise when, you know, that, that you rise bit, which is so healing and warm and like a, like a, a balm, B-A-L-M, um, that, um, that in that moment that Julie released and let go, that's the moment that things turn for Tony and that the descent into darkness really begins. Okay, so so then we get to, I'm really not sure how to rehearse this gang, especially, um, I don't even know if we can rehearse it. Why don't I just talk through it and then we'll listen to it, okay? Um, um, uh, so for those of you who are following along with the music, take a look at, at measure 116. So as I was saying, well, first, just a reminder that within the sacred veil, that there is um, there's this endless iteration of the number three. Things are repeated three times over and over and over, and this was very intentional. Uh, and it's not just that things are are repeated, but then even Julie's motive has three notes in it. It also starts on a C, goes up a third, down a third. So you see this all over the place, and we do this with Tony's poetry too. We repeat each of the verses three times. And then there's three verses, right? So this endless iteration of the idea of a third. And so when we get to that first, you rise, Julie's you rise. And those slides, those were all established much earlier in the piece in, um, in whenever there's birth. Um, that's the fifth movement. And it's, it's in that moment that I imagine skin on skin and that those slides are just a lazy, lazy day. I also loved how the, the, con, the context of contrasting those slides with these, the, the, the grief of, of breathing and, and wailing. And all, all of those just glide up, glide up. And, it, and if you ever get a chance to hear this live, um, the effect is so magnificent. I don't say this as a composer, just as an as someone standing in front of the audience hearing all of it happen. It's it's that perfect vowel, you uh, rise when it comes up, and even rise the Z on that. You feel really for the first time, especially in the context of the piece, just oh, uh, you know, it's just it's like like a weight is lifted from your shoulders. It's such a beautiful moment. And then 
this continues. And then it's here in 24 for the first time that we, that everything flips and turns dark. And, and I very intentionally wanted to do this. I, I imagined in Tony's world, you know, that, that Julie is letting go and rising. And there's this moment where, where the world just turns like this, just, it starts melting on itself and it's, it's horrifying and, and terrible and disorienting and, and all of that. And then it builds up this, by the way, again, for music nerds out there, um, all of this is happening with the sopranos and with the altos where they're going and then they kind of uh, over the top of each other or the sopranos who are singing and then and then they over the top they're this is all in my mind this is just um a, a modern version of what monteverdi would have done that's when i was writing it i was thinking very much about monteverdi and that that beautiful thing that he does I also do that in Leonardo Dreams, but those suspensions that, that or you know, bum, bum. actually, this if if we weren't doing the slides, this could very easily be a little Monteverdi gesture. All of this, then we get to we, we push, push, push forward, and finally, then in measure twenty-eight, we come to this, right, and then over two full measures, the sopranos. They come to here. And for those of you who don't have the sheet music, and it's super simple the way that it's notated. It's you've got this F up here, and you've got it for two, two full measures. And then there's just a line that says bend to here. That's it. <laughs> and I say it's easy to notate it because it's so easy to notate it. I remember thinking, oh yeah, it's that simple. Performing it is this otherworldly adventure. It is so difficult to be not only a, a soprano and then bend a half pitch over two measures, but then to do it as a group and then on the same vowel and then without breathing. Also because, you know, you come into this, I and you've just slowly got to bend. It's, it's way, way more difficult than it looks on the page. Um, the, the master crowd knocked it out of the park on the recording. Um, we had a moment during the second performance of it when we were live where, um, if any of you know what frizzin is, right? It's just that the, um, those chills up and down your back and I was conducting and it was, it was like someone had dumped a, a swimming pool full of chills on me. Just my entire body was filled with it, with the, just the sound, the physical sound of hearing that become that thing. Right. Um, and then, then we introduced this, uh, the, and, and tenors are slowly coming down here. And it finally resolves then and it, over in, in uh, measure 35 to here. So <laughs> the construction in this was, was simply that it, it never gets to really resolve. It, it, uh, we talked about this in, in some of the other conversations I've done about this, but the idea of grief or that moment of pain, it's not that in that pain you, you suddenly get released, like, ah, oh, okay, everything's gonna be okay. I don't think it works that way. I think it's it's this thing that you learn to live with, you, you find peace with it, but there's always going to be this splinter under the skin, always. And in fact, the very last chord, right? There's still that fourth in there even in the, the midst of a resolution, that sliver is always there. Um, then you hear in, in 38, 39, when we take off again, and, and the basses and tenors. So th th this, was, this was all intentional here to, to paint Tony as, you know, he's saying... Um, He's saying fading yet already gone, what calls you I cannot provide. I can really relate to this. Uh, I don't know if this is a universal thing. Um, and I, I certainly don't want to have, have a flattened view of gender. But I know that, that for myself as a man, as a husband, and as a father, there's an instinct to provide. Uh, 
it's of course not that mothers don't have that or not that everybody doesn't have some version of that, but maybe it's even cultural, but it feels instinctual. It feels like I, I need to provide for these people that, that are in my family. And Tony, it's so honest when he says um, that, that what calls you, I cannot provide that I, I can't do this. I, I don't have it. I can't give it. That's, that is such an honest, vulnerable, painful realization to come to. And the way that I tried to paint that was, was that we get the most masculine possible sound, that the, the basses and tenors in the low part of their register, the bass is there. Um, and and that, that also, I any of you who have ever worked with me live know that I have almost a fetish for the letter F, fading. I'll always try to bring it out if, I had this half-baked theory that, that what we're doing with consonants when we sing them, these kinds of things, is that we're, we're sending little arrows into the audience's breastplate and slowly opening their chest so that we can get straight to the heart. And here, I, I love this idea of fading, fading, fading. There's three knife edges that are just slowly cutting away any armor that the listener might have left. So while all of that is going on, you can see in measure 37, 38, and 39 that the sopranos then are singing, right? And they, so now it becomes a wail, but again, it's Julie's theme, just wailing and wailing. It's, it's as if she's just crying out her name or just the, the memory of herself or whatever is left in that moment. Um, and and then then we finally come back down to, um, to then the second you rise forty nine fifty. This is in measure fifty one, and now it's the same thing again, but this time we just expand it by adding the those bases and baritones and start the baritones, and then because the last time. The first time, the, the first time that we we had that turn where we went this little bit here, what we do now for the first time is we leap right to it. The second time, we don't need to teach the the audience anymore. There's going to be this turn. Actually, it's much more abrupt. And okay, um, in a in a strange way, the the image that I have in my mind as we make this turn each time is. You know when you're going up a roller coaster, you know, and and it's kind of exciting, setting, and then you get to the top and you look over the edge. That's what this turn is, I think, where where there's this dawning in your mind that oh, this is this is very very real, and there's actually no way to get off the roller coaster now. Now the only way, um, the only way out of this is through it. And so so then again we we build to that that terrible, terrible, uh, the I fall bit, but now I've, I've revoiced it a little differently, right? So now put, instead of the altos here, the altos are here. And that may seem like a, like a, just a small difference. It's just raising the altos a fourth, but to put the altos here in that register, suddenly it gives them all the power. Altos are incredibly powerful in this this register right here. And so the change I find when, when performing it is quite dramatic. The first time has kind of a fullness. And now the sec second time, because the altos are here, and then we come down, right? And then the tenors, then you raise them into the, just that soaring part of their register. And I love that what's happening here harmonically is as they fall, we get that major minor of the of the of the cancer, and then we finally land on that, where it's it's a major chord, but it's <laughs> in context, it's not a, it's not a, a resolution. It's it's more just it's it's as if you're being saturated by by the the amount of emotion and and colors that are happening uh, in the moment of this drama. Uh, and then, then it falls, 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 uh, comes down a little further, and then finally we get to, we get to this third verse. Um, and I can remember when when Tony sent this to me, the broken with a heavy hand, I reach to you and close your eyes. Um, (laughs) 
so so first it's it's just it's just exquisite poetry um it's simple and it says what it is and um tony and i often joke about poetry that says what's on on the tin right that okay here it is there's just there's no adornment to it but harder for me was that i i knew tony had actually experienced this had had truly lived this and he speaks so eloquently about it in public um i don't know how he does it i don't know how he has found a way to to walk with grace through the memory of this moment but over the years tony and i have talked about this this actual moment um in his life and him giving me these words and then asking me to set them or not asking me just <laughs> allowing me to set them i guess um yeah uh <laughs> i don't i don't have words for this um <clears throat> the the idea then for me was just to to make it as unadorned as possible right um also what we get is the first two verses even at the beginning when the the basses and tenors are singing they're singing this right but the tenors are holding this note above them and and so so they're they're providing the sustained like as if time has stopped but here now for the first time there is no sustain at all and so what we get in all of those dreadful pauses is just complete silence right and we hear now with, without any drama without any um none of it's manufactured anymore you just hear the sighing like in 75 and then and uh, there's just these empty silences and i think those silences last an eternity it's um yeah i can also tell you just from a personal point of view it's incredibly difficult to conduct because it's it's in this moment that it's uh for the singers it's perilous be, uh in that much much of singing can be a technical exercise and just trying to sing the notes right and the, the words right and you're engaging with the poetry engaging with the meaning but in in this moment um it's it's a razor's edge between the, the moment you really consider what it is you're singing it's hard not to be consumed by the moment and not just not to make this all about me but um but be as the conductor then it, it, there's there's this odd experience where where i have to detach uh each time i've conducted this i try to detach because i know that if i start to well up if i have tears in my eyes or if i'm shaking then then the singers it's it what doesn't help them at all at all and so each time i've done this i um i'm playing number games in my mind or i'm uh, deconstructing the words or thinking about um oh the, the altos and this and sopranos and just trying to find an intellectual way of of being in the moment so that so that the singers don't have someone modeling for them uh this this actual breaking because not only do they need it here but now they really need it for which is i think probably of all the things i've composed this is this is probably the most difficult to perform and this is uh this is all of page 124 in the full score, but this is like measures 89 through to the end, basically. Um, you've, you've got these extreme registers, right? So in 89, the sopranos here, and then first sopranos, that B flat, which is the highest note in the entire piece, very much on purpose. If any of you know when David heard, there's a high C from the sopranos which is ludicrous writing now that I think about it. Um, but there's only one C and it comes at the absolute climax of the piece. That's the, that's the only place it can go. So I save that B flat for here. And then, but you've also got the baritones on that F. And if, if a baritone is singing cold and, and is just starting from scratch and can, 
a, a good baritone can sing that no problem. That's a nice, healthy, pingy note for a baritone. But after 50 plus minutes of singing this piece and unbelievably sustained, and also if you're a baritone in this piece, you're down in the depths with the basses and you're up high here. This is truly, truly difficult. And um, <laughs> I know um, when, when I did this with my choir in London, um, uh, Greg Beardsell, who is, uh, um, he's, he's just, he's an amazing baritone and a good friend. Um, he just raised his hand. He said, would you mind just taking all of this a little bit faster, please? Because <laughs> we can't do it. <laughs> um, yeah, Greg. Um, uh, yeah, it's just, it's crazy. And then, you know, you've got the tenors on this sustained G in 93 for four measures. It's ludicrous writing. I can look at it on the page. And I think if I were a composition teacher, I would just say, this is, this is terribly written. <laughs> this is, this is going to be disaster. And the thing is, it's, it's not that it's terribly written. I, <laughs> it's, it's possible. It's definitely possible. There's an approach to it and you have to learn how to do it. Uh, but it, it's an intense, intense physical experience. The, the whole thing here. Altos also way, way up there in the stratosphere, right, for altos. Um, and the thing is, it's, it's not just that it's, it's so crazy on this page. It's that you have to have this page, and then over the next minute and a half, you've got to do this as seamlessly and gracefully as possible to get all the way down. And then the part that kills me always, is, it, just from a technical standpoint, is that this entire movement is nine minutes long. It's a cappella, and you end with, you know, you end here. Now imagine all of you who have sung the choirs, nine minutes of a cappella music. And then what you do is you take a single breath and you sing, child of wonder. And you're still a cappella for an entire verse of that, right? And then we come back to, you're here. And then hopefully, after 10 minutes of singing a cappella, you sing, and then the piano comes in. And, you know, you really hope, okay, I hope I'm still in the same key. It's such, um, yeah, it's, as someone who's, who's written a lot of choral music, it's just nuts. It's really nuts. And I remember writing it and thinking, this is asking almost the impossible from a group of singers and a group of musicians. However, I think this moment requires the, the impossible or the almost impossible. I think it's important enough and difficult enough that it requires the singers to to give every ounce of what they can do technically spiritually emotionally uh and it's written on purpose that way so that it, it causes a kind of focus to do something like this one of my uh um favorite pieces in the world is the sacre du printemps the rite of spring by um by stravinsky and the second half of the piece, it's, if you ever look at the score, the measure numbers are, they're bonkers. They're really bonkers. And in fact, Bernstein and I think several of the conductors have rebarred it to make it easier for the, because it's, it's so difficult. It's, it's, the, the conductor is the only one on the beat and there's little five eights here and there. And it's, however, I'm absolutely convinced that, that Stravinsky did it on purpose because anytime I've ever seen this, it doesn't matter how good the orchestra is, um, I think last time I saw it was with the L.A. Phil and Gustavo Dudamel was conducting. And you get to that moment, bah, bah, and you have people who have been playing in orchestra for 30, 35, 40 years, and everybody just leans forward. You just see everybody. You, you simply can't perform that musically without this extraordinary concentration. And I, I think Stravinsky built that into the piece. I think he knew, okay, here's how you get not only this rhythm and sound out of the orchestra, but an intensity from the orchestra, like a, an emotional and uh, intellectual intensity. And I think that's what I was hoping to do when I wrote this piece, is that, that for the singers, that you leave everything on the table after this, that, that, that you, you let the fire consume you completely on, on every level. Yeah, the, um, <laughs> if any of you are still listening. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I joke about this because I'm seeing all these beautiful comments from all of you, uh, but I, I joke about it only because it's, it's a truly surreal experience to be just talking 
into a camera. I'm literally just looking at a camera and talking about all of this stuff, and I'm hoping that any of this is is landing and um, and uh, is interesting for all of you, or or at the very least useful. Um, what I'm thinking I'd like to do right now, gang, is let's uh, let's listen to it. Okay, let's let's listen to it, and I'm gonna put up the version that has the the, ly the lyrics on it. And we'll listen all the way through it, and then at the end, I'll take some of your questions, if any of you do have any questions. So um, even while the piece is playing, if you have any questions, type them up here, and, and I'll see if I can get to them. But what we're going to do with, with your approval is, um, let me see, I wrote down. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we're going to start. Um, we'll start right at the, um, let's see, do it this way. Uh, we're going to start right before the movement that precedes this. So we're going to do the end of movement number nine. Or yes, into we'll do all of movement 10, which is called Pray Hard. And then that's going to take us into uh, movement 11, You Rise, I Fall. And the reason for me is this is really the whole second half of this piece of the Sacred Veil is all one piece. But the setup for this, I think, is essential. That in Pray Hard, you get you get the ticking again of the of of the clock this and it's julie's theme again right and then when she sings i just got out of the hospital tonight and see some bad news she's going to sing that you'll hear what she's doing is then on and then she's doing exactly what the cello does playing that fate theme and then when it turns to major and she she really strongly says um, pray hard, pray with me. And, and the last thing she says, don't give up on me. Like we talked before, then we hear Julie's theme. And I think it's the only way to truly set up you rise, I fall. We'll start on the moment here where, where I quoted Tony, I wrote the poetry for movement nine, but I quoted Tony directly from lyrics that he wrote for me for Leonardo, um, dreams of his flying machine. And it's, it's that lyric. He steals himself, takes one last breath and leaps. All right, here we go again.
<laughs> Welcome back, everybody. Um, uh, <laughs> real quick, so everybody was incredibly generous and and uh, lovely. Wook Chewy, um, hey buddy, we or or. Um, Whoever you are, Wook Chewy, we're happy that you're here. Welcome. Uh, the idea is we're going through a piece called, um, an entire piece called Sacred Veil, and this is just one movement from it. And I described it uh, for about 30 minutes or 35 minutes, and then we just listened to it. It's a long, long piece. So that's why that's why you're seeing both. Anyway, welcome. We're glad you're here. And and thank you, everybody else, for being so, uh, so generous. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll be like super, super honest about this. And again, I'm sorry that I keep making this about me, but <laughs> I'm alone in a room. Um, uh, I, I don't know how many times I really want to hear that in, again in my life. I know I'll have to conduct it. And I know that um, I'll be at performances, of course. I can't imagine in my wildest dreams, I can't imagine sitting in the audience and listening to someone else conduct it. It's hard enough just sitting here listening to it. Uh, when when we were doing the edits for the for the album, never once did I listen to the whole piece all the way through. I popped in and out here and there, but I, I never kind of took it all in in one shot. Uh, I, I feel that music has that music is medicine. That that there's something physiological about the the effect that music has on our bodies, on our brains, on our spirits, our hearts, and um, I think. Sometimes there's a combination of notes and rhythms and ideas that that get put into music that, that that really have a physiological effect. And I don't know about all of you, but I just I actually feel this in my body. Um, um, it's the kind of thing that I just can't I can't dip in and dip into and out of. Today here in my little world, it's um, uh, you know we're celebrating my son's birthday, and so I woke up. My wife and I were wrapping presents, we're gonna surprise them. And um, and then as soon as we leave here, then I'll go and and um, <laughs> celebrate his birthday with him. Um, and it's, I think maybe when I was younger, I was able to compartmentalize all this emotional world better than I can now, but now it's to go into this piece and really talk about it with all of you and to feel it and also to see to see all of your comments and then to to just have this experience with all of you and then to go back to, to regular life. Um, it's, it's profoundly difficult. And the, the, the laughable part on, on my part, I think, is that all I did was write a piece about it. I didn't have to live this. I, I can't imagine what it is, what Julie and Tony went through where they lived this every day. And they celebrated birthdays. They made breakfast. They wrapped presents. They compartmentalized as best they could. They didn't compartmentalize. It's ordinary people living under extraordinary circumstances and somehow living with grace. It's uh, it's astonishing to me, and I I guess the the one thing that I I'm, I'm taking out of the piece and especially hearing Tony talk about it and his poetry is is just the strength that, to to be aware of what people are capable of. It's, it's inspiring, truly. Oh, thanks guys for all the happy birthday wishes, uh, wishes, um, gang. Should we should we take a couple questions? If if any of you out there have any, I saw Elizabeth had one. Um, let me see where is that Elizabeth? Um, it's not so easy to find these questions on this this thing. I'm, yeah, here it is. Let me see Elizabeth. So Elizabeth wrote, uh, "I'm curious why you have the women sing. You rise when she is rising and he is falling." Yeah. So so you're talking about when the turn happens, Elizabeth, and then each time, I, I think what happens. I, I do this often in my pieces. I, I do it a lot in When David Heard, and especially here, that the choir plays multiple roles, right? So at sometimes, sometimes they represent Tony, and even sometimes the women and men together represent Tony. Sometimes the women represent only Julie, but then sometimes the men and women represent Julie. Sometimes the choir is acting as, like at the beginning, whenever there's birth or death, this bit, they, they're acting as the... Uh, like a Greek chorus almost. They're distant from it and preparing the audience. Um, sometimes they're a storyteller, it's an active storyteller. And so in this case, it's almost as if the first two you rises are, th it's the sound of Julie. And then the second, the third one, they 
they became they become the sonic pain. They they have to leave that role and now just become this new thing. They have to take on this this other role. And then ultimately when they hit I fall and it's coming down, and even though it's Tony's story or Tony's voice at that time saying it, you need all the, the whole spectrum of voices to to paint Tony's emotional world. Um it's a super good question because I spend a lot of time thinking about it and I'm rarely on the nose as I am in this where when the men sing it's Tony's voice and where the women sing is Julie's voice there's some movements where it's just very clear this is this is this person speaking and this is this person speaking but there's always kind of this this blending of it just to throw this out there if there's any Hamilton fans like me uh, nobody does this better than Lin-Manuel Miranda where in the middle of a single song it can be a uh, he could be talking about himself or she can be talking about herself and then suddenly becomes a narrator to a scene then suddenly is talking about a narrator almost in a historical sense the chorus is part of the action they're a greek chorus they're characters there's it just like almost every sentence there's this dance between which perspective we're hearing from um i find that really interesting uh, let me take a look at some other questions here um um put this one up Mothy I, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right Mothy or Mothy uh, as a composition student I'm always hesitant to use my favorite sounds fearing that I won't be able to use them again in future pieces that might deserve them more could you help me <laughs> oh man do I know that feeling okay I can't remember first of all which writer I I I, I there's a quote you can probably find this on the internet but it's a, a writer not a co composer but she basically says if you have a good idea use it now don't save your good idea. Don't worry that you're not going to have a good idea later. Use your best idea now, even if it's a once-in-a-lifetime idea. Use it today. I couldn't agree more with that. Throw it all on the table. You're going to come up with other ideas later on. The second thing is, in terms of your favorite sounds, I didn't do this intentionally. At least I don't... Well, let me describe to you what happened for me. So... Early, early, early on, I mean, in fact, the very first piece I wrote is called Go Lovely Rose, and it starts this way. It just does this, right? Those, those, those first five notes. The entire choir starts on a single note, they peel off, and they build this Lydian cluster. Okay, then I wrote my second piece, which was Cloudburst, and I used that same Lydian cluster. But now I added that seventh to it, and it was, this was just me playing with this emotional, could I could I find a chord like this that sounds like beauty and mystical beauty is what that sounds like to me. And then the same thing in Rain, but then, oh, if you add a note, it sounds like wonder and awe at the same time as that mystical beauty. Then what you do is once you've got that language, then you can quote yourself for the rest of your life because now that means something deep, deep, deep to you. So for instance, in, in Water Night, um, the choir sings Eyes of Dream Water. Eyes of Dream Water. Oops, uh, uh, where is it? Uh, there it is, Dream Water. We're in this key. Dream Water. So that chord on Dream Water is exactly the same chord as as the Cloudburst chord. The, and so it's Dream Water. It's about water mysticism. So you come to that in another setting. You say, oh, I've, I already have a word for that. I have this sonic word for that. I'll use that there. And then what you start doing is you start building a style and a language uh, year upon year upon year. And and and, and at least in, in my own world, I probably, I don't know, I probably have three or four dozen different musical words or concepts that I use all the time and that I quote myself and use here and there. And, and it can really build a, a coherent worldview. So not just piece by piece by piece, but actually then because you're a beginning composer, 10 pieces from now, you'll be able to look back and go, oh yeah, this is actually how I see the world. I can hear it in there. Um, so don't be afraid of that at all. I think I think it's a strength. Um, <laughs> quote yourself for the rest of your life. What a genius. <laughs> Thanks, Yash. <laughs> um, uh, um, yeah, you're all leaving me the sweetest possible messages. Um, Leah wrote, Eric, I had the honor of meeting you and being conducted by you two years ago at Carnegie Hall. Best experience of my life. Yeah, it's, uh, boy, don't you miss singing together, Leah? Um, 
Oof, I will really, really rejoice. <laughs> that word on purpose, rejoice, when, when we are through the pandemic and we're all back together singing safely. I'm truly looking forward to that. Um, yeah, those, those were beautiful concerts. Um, yeah, gang, uh, I'm, I'm just going to put this up there because it's so nice. Barbie, uh, thank you again for giving so generously of your time to explain how you see, hear, feel your beautiful music. Thank you for being here, Barbie, with me. And thank you all of all of you. Um, it, it really means the world. I'll keep, I'll keep doing this. You know, we can hang out and go through different pieces and talk about all kinds of things. Maybe, maybe what I'll do is I'll, I'll put up a couple of posts on social media and say, you know, what, what would you like to talk about? What do you, what do you, uh, you know, what, what's interesting and, and we can do some deep dives in a whole bunch of different, uh, different ways. I'm, I'm happy to spend this time with you and it's actually, it's really good for my soul to even just to see you in the, in the chat room. Um, Gang, why don't we leave it there? I have have a beautiful, beautiful Saturday. A beautiful here in the states, it's Labor Day weekend, so we've got a three day weekend. If any of you still have jobs, um, be well, be safe, be smart. Yeah, if if you're going to go out, just be incredibly careful around people. Wear a mask. Um, thank you all so much for being here, and uh, take care. We'll see each other soon. <laughs>